Father, we give you thanks and praise that we can approach your word and explore it freely in this place. And we would ask today, Lord, that you'll help give us a new understanding of the covenant that you made with Noah and how that applies to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to bring a Bible reading to you this morning from the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 8, verse 20, through to chapter 9, verse 17. So it's quite a long reading, but it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating one. So I assume that you all know the story of the flood. Anyone not know what the story of the flood's all about? Okay, you know that. So this is after the flood. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of all the un of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, Night and day will never cease. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky, on every creature that moves along the ground and all the fish in the sea. They are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. But you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal. And from each human being too, I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. As for you, be fruitful and increase in number. Multiply on the earth and increase upon it. Then God said to Noah and his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on the earth. This is the word of the Lord for us for this morning. Well, I want to move a completely different direction in one moment. Who remembers Slim Dusty? Yeah, any of you enjoy his music? Yeah, good, excellent, excellent. I used to enjoy his music too. And one of the songs that I liked was called Looking Forward, Looking Back. Interesting song. Looking forward, looking back, I've come a long way down the track, got a long way left to go, making songs from what I know, making sense of what I've seen, all the love we've had between, you and I along the track, looking forward, looking back. A fascinating song about perspective. When you get the right perspective life begins to make some sense. And as Slim is saying here, you really need to look to the future to understand the past. That's the first point I want to make this morning. It's about looking forward, looking back. One of the, the basic doctrines of Christianity is that history is God's highway to an appointed future. God himself is the minister for transport and the chief engineer and the head foreman on the job. History is not some random path cut through the country of people without a compass. It's a highway that leads from creation to consummation. 
It's engineered by God, who directs everything from his sovereign standpoint in the future. History is going somewhere. God appointed the goal before the foundation of the world. And under his overarching providence, all events, all events serve that goal. Listen to what the psalmist says. Psalm 139, verse 16. He says, your eyes, talking to God, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. God knows already how long you and I are going to live. He knows all the things you're going to do. He knows it already. So before you get up tomorrow to make your little contribution to God's highway of history, he's already written down in his book what you will accomplish. And when he writes it down, he's not guessing. According to Isaiah, Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10 says this, Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning. From ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. So in the beginning of history, God saw the end of history. He saw what he aimed to perform. He knew what he had, what had to be done to achieve it. And he decreed, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. So in a very real sense, God runs history from the future. He stands, as it were, already at the destination. He guides the road crew so that his highway reaches its destination. That means if you want an explanation for historical events, don't just look back to the past. That's what historians do. You also need to look to the future. If the ultimate cause of things is running history from the future, then the ultimate explanation is also to be found in the future. If the road crew builds a sweeping curve to the east, it's probably because there was a great big swamp in the West. Yeah? Indeed, our New Testament explains the Old Testament. If you don't believe in a God who is powerfully involved in history, then the only explanation of the events you'll be looking at are past causes, not future purposes. But as soon as you reckon with the God of the Bible, tomorrow will always be part of today's explanation. This means that when we think about the acts of God in the Old Testament, we should include asking questions like this. How does this turn in the Old Testament highway lead to a decisive New Testament event where God's Son joins the highway crew for 30 years? If if God runs history from the future and if the coming of His Son into history is a foretaste of the future then the experiences of Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, these are all preparations for the coming of Jesus Christ. And God made a covenant, an agreement with each of these men. And covenants, agreements, always contain a promise. Now listen to this scripture. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20 says, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him... The Amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Fascinating. So therefore, the coming of Christ was what the future was the future which guided all of God's work in the Old Testament times. And today, and for the next four Sundays, I want to look with you at God's covenants with Noah, Abraham, Moses, and David. God made more covenants, but I want to look at these four particularly. And and, and with a view of how they prepare the way for Christ. And I pray that your confidence in God's planning and his, and his engineering skills will be strengthened. So today we're going to be looking at God's covenant with Noah. This covenant prepared the way for Jesus Christ to come into the world. And this is not a children's story. So often you remember the story of Noah and the ark and there's a cute little picture of this thing that looks a bit like a weird bathtubby thing and the giraffe's head is poking out the elephant's hanging over with his googly eyes you know over the edge that is not the story 
This is not the story. Get away from that view. I want you to be horrified by this story. Have a look at this next picture. This is a picture by Gustave Doré. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about this picture. This, this Gustave Doré, he was a French artist from the 1850s, and this is, this is a, a, a wood, wood cutting that he made, an engraving. And there's an expanse, there's a huge expanse of empty sea. There's one lone rock protruding a few feet above the waves. There are three terrified children on the rock and they are slipping into the sea. And there's a mother and a father desperately trying to push a fourth little baby to safety. On this rock there sits a giant tiger. Bodies are floating in the water and overhead ex uh, uh, the exhausted vultures. So this picture tells us about the story of Noah and the ark. This is about the flood of God. He destroyed he destroyed all humanity bar one family. He destroyed all the living creatures on the earth. This is a horror story. This is not a cutesy little story. It's a horror story. This is about God's judgment on the earth. God was upset about making mankind. He was upset about our sin and he destroyed humanity bar one family. This is a horror story. And there's a threefold message in this story of the flood. First of all, it's about the wickedness of man that is so very great and that it, man's heart is full of evil continually. You turn on the bad news lately, nothing's changed, does it? Secondly, God's patience does come to an end and he destroys unrepentant sinners in judgment. That's going to happen again. Thirdly, and thankfully, God does not surrender his purpose in creating human beings. Even in judgment, God does not leave off building his highway. His counsel will stand and he will accomplish his purposes. Listen to God's purpose. This is found in Numbers 14, verse 21. All the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. That's a day that's coming. All the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. That's coming. That's coming. That's God's big plan. Judgment is real. Judgment is horrible. But it's not the last word. The story points forward to an as yet unknown remedy. So let's have a look at these points. The first one is the wickedness of the human heart. The first thing the story of the flood teaches us is that the human heart, in its natural condition, is very wicked. Now and then the Old Testament gives an explicit pronouncement about the human depravity. For example, Psalm 51 verse 5. Surely I was sinful from birth, from the time my mother conceived me. Think about that for a second. When the sperm and the egg got together from that moment, you were sinful. You'd done nothing, but you were sinful from that moment. You've already missed God's mark. And generally, as we, as we read the Bible, the evil of the human heart is simply portrayed in, in the results. You know? After the fall in Genesis chapter 3, Adam, he passes the buck and blames Eve. Cain kills his brother. Lamech kills a boy, commits bigamy, boasts. And then you get Genesis chapter 6 verse 5, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. And then... Verse 11 comes along and shows that all this inward evil was breaking out everywhere. Genesis 6 verse 11. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. And it still is. Exactly. So the first lesson of the flood is the doctrine of sin. The, this coming Christmas season makes no sense. Christmas makes no sense without understanding sin. Because Jesus came into the world, what? To save sinners. That's us. So the first point of the flood is that we are sinners and we deserve judgment. And with incredible sadness, incredible sadness, I say that we have not changed one iota. We've learnt nothing. And the Bible proves it to us. Let me show it to you. Our hearts weren't changed after the flood. You'd think we'd learn, wouldn't you? After such a cataclysmic event... I mean, this, this is the time, when you think of the story of the flood, there would have been, 
There's so much science behind this whole thing as well. You know, the, the great fountains of the deep opened up, the, the earth broke up, all the, all the continents separated from one another, the, the water came up, the water came up. It's amazing what happened there. We haven't learnt anything from this whole huge cataclysmic event. So in Genesis chapter 8, verse 20, 20, 21, it says, After the flood, God says in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. So God's assessment of our moral condition has not been improved by the flood at all. He's not so naive as to think that Noah and his descendants were without sin. Look what happens after the flood. Genesis chapter 9 verse 20. Noah planted a vineyard and he drank the wine and he became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. Noah got plastered. That's what happened. And he took off his clothes and he fell down dead drunk in his tent. And that led to the sin of his son. And so, so just after the first man, after creation, he, he led the way of sin for all his posterity. So the first man after the flood leads the way into sin for all his continuing posterity. So before the flood and after the flood, the human nature is corrupt. But what really surprises me and emphasizes the incredible grace of God is Genesis chapter 6, verse 8. The reason Noah was spared was because he found favor or grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was not without sin. He was human. He was sinful from the moment he was conceived, okay? But he found favor with God. Why? Because it tells us in verse 9 that he walked with God. That means, to walk with God means that you agree with God. He agreed with God about the evil of his own sin. He turned from it. He trusted God for grace. And he's called righteous and blameless in Genesis 6 verse 9. Being blameless in the Old Testament doesn't always mean sinless, okay? A man is blameless if he does not persist in his blameworthy actions. If he hates them, if he turns from them, if he comes to God seeking mercy, then a man is blameless. And neither does righteous mean sinless either. In the Old Testament, a righteous man is a sinner who hates his sin, who turns from it, who trusts God, who pursues obedience, and enjoys acceptance by God's grace. Grace is an undeserved free gift. And this is confirmed in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. By faith Noah, when warned about the things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. Noah believed God and because of that he was considered to be righteous and blameless. So Noah is not an exception to the rule of universal sinfulness. What he experienced is what the Old Testament called the circumcision of the heart or I think in what we would call the new birth in some ways. And that gave rise to repentance and to faith. So the doctrine of sin stands as the first lesson of this story. Apart from being born again, apart from our having faith, it may, may be said of every single one of us, every imagination and every thought of our hearts is only evil continually. If that doctrine is rejected, the meaning of the flood collapses and this whole Advent season... Christmas time, which is coming. Have you noticed it's already in the shops? We haven't even had the whole ridiculousness of Halloween yet and already the Christmas stuff happening. Well, if you forget about this whole doctrine of sin, it just becomes some pretty fairy tale. You know, a nice time to give things to the kids. Let's move to the second point here, that, that God's patience does come to an end. The second lesson of the flood is that God's patience comes to an end and he destroys unrepentant sinners. This is the horror story. According to Genesis 6 verse 7, the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created. And with them the animals, the birds and the creatures that move along the ground. For I regret that I have made them. Our sinfulness was so great that even the animals got wiped out. We've polluted everything. Then in Genesis chapter 6 verse 13, God says to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people. For the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. 
Then in verse 17, he says, I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. After these three hammer-like blows, God's intention comes to the headlines. Genesis 7, verse 21. Every living thing that moved on the land perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swarm over the earth and all mankind. Do you see the horror of this story? In a sense, this is a children's story because even a child can understand it. But it's not a cutesy story, is it? Because its lessons are horrible. God hates sin and he punishes those who are unrepentant. When Jesus came into the world, he taught exactly the same thing about sin. Only he made punishment eternal. Matthew 18, verse 8, Jesus says, If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. God's flood and God's son teach the same lesson. God hates sin and he punishes those who are unrepentant sinners with unspeakable judgment. But, praise God, God does not surrender his purposes for man. And I want to move on to this point. This is the third lesson from the flood. Namely, that in spite of man's intolerable sinfulness, God does not surrender his purpose in creating human beings. God created man in his image. He aims for man to fill the earth with God's glory, reflected in our faith and in our righteousness. So he preserves one man and his family. And he gives them the duty and the blessing of filling the whole earth again. Notice how Genesis 9 verse 1 is the same mission that was given to Adam in the beginning. Genesis 9 verse 1. God blessed Noah and his sons saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. Then in verse 7 the commands repeated, Be fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly on the earth and multiply in it. He wants people to be breeding and bringing forth God's children. God is prepared to start over again. So in a way, Noah was a new Adam, in a way. But this beginning this time wasn't in paradise like it was for the first Adam. This new Adam must must, must deal with, with three real threats against him and in his mission to fill the earth. There's a threat from animals, there's a threat from man, and there's a threat from God. So God makes three very special provisions to protect the life of man in the new world where sin and corruption are soon going to abound. First of all, God gives man new rights over the animals so they will not threaten him but serve him even as food. Listen to this, Genesis 9 verses 2 and 3. God says to Noah, The fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and on all the birds in the sky, on every creature that moves along the ground, and on all the fish in the sea, they are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. So, what God is doing here is supporting man's mission to fill the earth with the knowledge of God's glory. Why? How? By removing the threat of animals. Man now has the right to put them into dread and fear and even the right to use them as food. First threat, put the side. Second threat. God gives man now a portion of the divine right to take human life and thus guard our society against murder. The mission to fill the earth is threatened by men as well as animals. And these, hence we have verses, uh, Genesis chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. Listen to what God says. For your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I'll demand an accounting from every animal and from each human being too. I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God, God has made mankind. Before the flood, God kept the prerogative to take life to himself. And you recall that that God threatens sevenfold vengeance on anyone who slays slays Cain, even though Cain was a murderer. But now God makes provision for murder, at least to be partly restrained by man. He makes murder a capital offence. Man is created in God's image. God's purpose is that people in his image fill the earth with his glory. 
Therefore, when a man presumes to snuff out the potential of that glory, he attacks God in such a way that his own execution by men becomes part of God's purpose. The point is that a special provision is made by God to protect his mission from the threat of men. And finally, God makes a covenant with Noah. So there's a threat also to humanity from God himself. How shall the earth ever again be filled with his glory if his wrath overflows in a flood against sin? So to protect men against the threat, God makes a covenant with Noah and with his sons in Genesis chapter 9, verse 11. Listen to what it says. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. That same promise is stated positively in Genesis 8, verse 22. God says, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will never cease. I am confident that our climate is going to maintain us until Jesus comes back and sorts everything out. Okay? God says so. I'm holding on to him and what he says. So God, in other words, he says, I give you protection from animals. I give you protection from man. And with my own covenant promise, I give you protection from me. I will uphold rather than destroy the natural world processes on which you depend for life. As long as the world lasts, I will withhold universal judgment like this and preserve the order of creation. So there are three lessons from the flood. Number one, the wickedness of man is very great and his heart is full of evil continually. Number two, God hates sin. His patience has an end and he destroys unrepentant sinners. Number three, yet God does not surrender his purpose in creation to fill the earth with men and women who reflect his glory in faith and obedience. But notice what all of this implies. Sin is just as much a problem after the flood as before the flood. The flood of judgment, the, the flood of judgment didn't eradicate sin. And the covenant of God's grace does not guarantee righteousness. If God's purpose was to fill the earth with the glory of his righteousness, then you've got to conclude one of two things. Either God is an absolute failure, or God is preparing for a greater event sometime in the future. Now, you and I know God is not a failure, is he? There is no failure in God. Therefore, the New Testament writers, they see the flood as a foreshadowing of final judgment. There is a final judgment coming. It's not going to be a flood. It's going to be a judgment of fire. And the ark is a foreshadowing. The ark of Noah is a foreshadowing of the final salvation that's offered to everyone in Jesus. And the days of Noah are typical of the last days before the coming, before the return of Jesus. Get that into your head for a second. We're living in the same times. It's just like before Noah, before the ark, before the flood. It's just like that now, isn't it? We're a step closer. Every breath, it's a one breath closer to the return of our Saviour. But the story of Noah and the flood is incomplete in itself because God still hates sin and there is no remedy for the problem that has been found. This story cries out for an epilogue. What's the next bit, Lord? What are you going to do? I know you're in charge of history. I know you're at the end of history. What are you going to do to solve the sin problem because it's not yet solved? Well, there's a final clue in this wonderful story about the epilogue that's to come. It's found in Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 and 22. Listen to this. At the end of the flood and before God made his covenant, Genesis 8, 20 to 22. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and taking some of the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. 
The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and he said in his heart, never again will I curse the ground because of humans. Even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood and never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. When I see that picture, that sacrifice that's taking place, there is a foreshadowing that God who has to find the remedy for the problem of sin will find another greater sacrifice. That greater sacrifice is going to be the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. He's pointing forward to what is still to come. There is an epilogue to this story. It begins with Advent. It begins with the season of Christmas. And the final remedy for sin has been found. Our Bible tells us so. Hebrews 9 verse 26 says, Christ appeared once for all at the end of the age to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Why aren't you cheering? The horror story has a glorious end. God finds a solution to the problem of sin. He sends his son, Jesus Christ. God still hates sin. We are still sinful, but God will never surrender his purpose to fill the earth with his glory. The final remedy is Jesus. Make sure that you are right with him this Christmas season, which is upon us already. Make sure that you share this story where you can with your brothers, your sisters, your friends, your relatives, and your enemies. Tell them all. Jesus is the solution to the great problem of sin. And God had a plan from the beginning. And he brought it to fruition. And one day we will stand before him and give an account. What did we do with the story of Jesus? Did you accept him? If you did, God will accept you. Did you not accept him? Well, you've already made your own decision. Depart from me. Make the right decision. Make sure that Jesus is your Savior and your Lord. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that you have great purposes, that from the very beginning you started showing us signs that Jesus was to come into the earth. Thank you, Father, for solving the problem of sin through the coming of Jesus. Thank you for the season of Christmas that is coming where people start to talk and think about what's this all about. I'm so stressed and and concerned about Christmas season and buying presents and all that sort of foolishness. Lord, help us to tell them the story of Jesus, of his coming, of his sacrifice and the difference that that made, that we can be right with you, that we can be considered righteous and blameless through faith in Jesus. That one sacrifice that was made at the end of the age to put away sin because of the sacrifice of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.